good afternoon, friends and supporters of New Plaza Cinema. There are at least three different Vincent Minnellis. There is the Vincent Minnelli of the great MGM musicals, such as Meet Me in St. Louis, An American in Paris, and The Bandwagon, which we've spoken about before on our talk back. There's the Vincent Minnelli of comedies, such as The Great Father of the Bride. There's the Vincent Minnelli of dramas, such as Tea and Sympathy. And there's the Vincent Minnelli of over-the-top melodramas such as The Cobweb in 1955 and today's film, Two Weeks in Another Town, which was based on a 1960 Irwin Shaw novel that Dan Cahill is going to talk a little bit more about momentarily. This was originally conceived as a comeback production for producer John Hausman and a possible uniting of Clark Gable and Spencer Tracy. But Gable's passing uh, in 1960 in November put an end to that pipe dream and various distractions on Hausman's part delayed the, the project from moving forward until 1961, at which point Manelli and the other principals were assembled. This is a film made during a very, well, every year in Hollywood history, including the present, is always an intense year, and there's always an industry crisis going on. But it really was pretty crisis-ridden at MGM when this picture was made. Uh, the studio was suffering major losses, not only on films like The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, there were some other big budget disappointments that had come out of the gate. The studio management that put two weeks in another town into production uh, is eventually going is actually going going to be out of jobs not long after the film is completed before a new management team comes in. It's a film that is uh, touching on an issue that was big in the film industry here: runaway production, movies going to Italy, Hollywood pictures going there for reasons of economy, to save costs. Uh, by that time, Rome, which we spoke about uh, this past Wednesday, was becoming uh, Hollywood on the Tiber, uh, where the Cinecita studio, which we briefly glimpse uh, in two weeks of, of, in another town, was being used as, a, as an extension of Hollywood uh, sound stages for epics such as Ben-Hur and Cleopatra and other films, of course, by great, great Italian filmmakers. So Rome is becoming the hotspot. And the narrative of Two Weeks of Another Town, which I'll talk more about, was not an improbable one, is that it could relate to several real-life experiences in Hollywood. But before we get into that, let's get a sense. Between you and I, MGM just threw this picture out into the market in August of 1962, after a rather intense behind the scenes editorial battle that Vincent Minnelli lost. So they didn't really care that much about the picture by this time, which had cost them quite a bit of money. But this is how it was marketed to audiences in 1962. Here is the original trailer. Against the frenzied background of the Via Veneto, Rome's Sunset Strip, all the fire and fury, the eye-popping frankness of Irwin Shaw's bestseller lashes the screen. Now, producer John Houseman and director Vincent Minnelli reveal the fascinating story of Rome's international film set. Like the incredible rise and fall of famous screen lover Jack Andrus, vividly portrayed by Kirk Douglas. For Jack's two weeks in another town, he was torn between a lost love and a new love. I like girls with black eyes, soft mouths. Jack was also torn between a lost career and a new career. I don't want your charity. If I'm through as an actor, I'm through. And to hell with you and the whole murderous business. And then what? You stupid, stubborn, washed-up ham! There are the movie directors like Maurice Kruger, a sensational role for Edward G. Robinson. Kruger was master of everything he surveyed. Everything, that is, except Mrs. Kruger, played by Claire Trevor, 
Maurice Kruger, the great lover. You don't care what they are, old or young, thin or fat, as long as you get your grubby hands on them. Here, too, are women of the world, like Carlotta, Sid Charisse. I've told you how you look to me, darling. How do I look to you? And here, of course, are the women of Rome. Dahlia Lavi, a girl meant for love. And Rosanna Schiaffino, as the temperamental foreign star who got her first lesson in American movie techniques. And there is Davy, a striking dramatic departure for popular George Hamilton. I pulled all your idiot tricks and plenty more. Only you still have a chance. Give her back to me. What does she mean to you? Two weeks of company in another town? Two Weeks in Another Town is hard-hitting drama that ever so frankly goes into the emotional lives of talented people who burn up their talents as they fight for success. Of romantic people who are ready to destroy each other in their search for love. One writer has described it as one of the last films made under the old Hollywood system about the old Hollywood system uh, before any film dealing with Hollywood uh, was set in the set in the far past. Let's go back and study the battles behind the camera, which are almost as intense as those in front of the camera, maybe even more so. We do mention the origins of the pro project, but the participation of what ended up being the team behind a, a major success for MGM 10 years earlier, The Bad and the Beautiful, which, as you could see in the trailer, is, is featured in the film briefly in a screening room where the Kirk Douglas and Edward G. Robinson characters view a film from their glorious past. He was facing a lot of challenges adapting the novel and also in his personal life. He took nearly a year to adapt the novel to the screenplay form. And he did make a considerable change from the Irwin Shaw novel. In the Irwin Shaw novel, the Kirk Douglas character is not a fading star who is in a sanatorium. He's actually a former star who is, and I'm not making this up, he is a, an advisor for NATO, not the North American Theater Association, but the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And uh, he has a very solid job there. He has a solid marriage in France, although he clearly has relationships on the, south, on the side. John Hausman suggested they change that character to make him more desperate from the Rome job he receives from the Kruger character. The screenplay encountered Predictable challenges from the production code office run at, run at the time by Jeffrey Sherlock. He was very upset with the initial drafts of the script. And I am quoting from a terrific book on Vincent Minnelli from the mid-80s by Stephen Harvey, by the way. It's uh, directed by Vincent Minnelli, which goes into tremendous detail on his MGM work. The production code office said, the script and discussion here presents a panorama of affairs interlocked and overlapping in a way that would seem to indicate that the moral law was suspended, if not actually abolished, during the writing of this script. It's difficult to conceive that fornication could be any more casually portrayed than it is done here. The portrayal of free and easy sexual intercourse is so graphically depicted herein that any pretense of presenting it in a moral light would appear to be almost ludicrous. That is apparently what the production code office wrote. I suspect the production code office was a little sheltered and hadn't seen a lot of European films coming in to the American market. They were still stuck in the past. In any, in any event, the head of the studio at the time, Joe Vogel, was determined to clean up the material 
during the writing stage. So if there was any fornication going on, it was depicted off screen and not corrupting the so-called innocent. That is where, that was the starting point. We see the elements coming together with Kirk Douglas, Edward G. Robinson. Uh, producer Hausman and star Kirk Douglas were both opposed to the casting of Sid Charisse. Uh, they felt it needed a more experienced actress for that part. Uh, Douglas got a little catty and actually arranged for her not to receive prominent ca- uh, credit in the promotion and, and for, the, for the film. And when a major scene of hers was cut later on, to the to the regret of Vincent Minnelli, Douglas wasn't complaining too much about that. We have the tr- the reteaming of Claire Trevor and Edward G. Robinson, who both had appeared in John Huston's Key Largo. She won a supporting actress Oscar for that film, and here was given kind of a thankless and one dimensional role as his crucifying wife. And as the trailer mentioned, the Israeli actress Dalia Lavi and Rosanna Schiaffino who were given great roles here, but whom Hollywood really didn't know what to to do with uh, pretty much after these films came out. Production started August, 1961. Vincent Minnelli flew to Rome for six weeks of pre-production work. Hausman, the producer, soon joined him. Then, according to the author of the Vincent Minnelli book, Stephen Harvey, uh, he Harvey felt that the hiring of Charles Schnee to, to do the screenplay was almost a cruel move, maybe un, unintentionally so, because Charles Schnee's private life bore in a very uncomfortable similarity to that of the Kirk Douglas character in the film. Uh, shockingly, Charles Schnee's wife, Mary, committed suicide just as this film was about to begin filming in October of 1961. Uh, And so very, very disturbing connections between the screenwriter's real life wife with the Claire Trevor character's attempted suicide in the film itself. Vincent Minnelli began by filming his cast wandering around Rome locales such as the Piazza Navona, the Spanish Steps, uh, Trastevere and the Via, Via Veneto, which w- they talked about, which leads to the Hotel Excelsior. Minnelli's objective was to try to do Federico Fellini one better because Fellini had achieved international success over the past year and uh, two years almost with La Dolce Vita, which shattered box office records around the world in its depiction of decadent Roman night life. And so, according to the uh, the Minnelli author, of uh, this Avenue Via Veneto exhibitionists rival Fellini for flamboyant absurdity, and unfortunately, Minnelli, in his objectives, was cut short by the studio, as I as I will mention. There are problems going on from the beginning because this nineteen day planned schedule of filming in Rome was delayed by. Manelli moving rather slowly than the studio wanted him to. Uh, and also Manelli wanting to film at the real Hotel Excelsior in Rome and a few other interiors on location where the studio felt these could have been recreated more affordably in Culver City. The company then will resume filming at MGM in Culver City on November 9th, 1961. They're going to film for 11 more weeks, and they will be utilizing sets from a George Cukor project called Lady L, a costume drama that is going to get postponed for a while. And those sets will be recycled for the film within a film that Edward G. Robinson's Robinson's Maurice Kruger is directing in two weeks from another town. Now, long story short, when the film was assembled, and Vincent Minnelli was not always around when his movies were being cut, but MGM ended up, after several disappointing previews, cutting 15 minutes out of the initial edit conceived by Vincent Minnelli. We, if you, when, when you watch the film, there, there are moments where scenes seem to be aborted. Early on, 
there's a nurse at the sanitarium talking to Kirk about the, the doctor wants to see him and it, the, they, they dissolve in the middle of mid sentence as she's talking where Claire Trevor, Trevor is cuddling Edward G. Robinson in bed or after an argument, they seem to leave that scene in mid sentence when Kirk, Kirk Douglas throws his traveler's checks at the arrogant Italian producer that scene prematurely ends and and i always felt there was an oddity in the continuity after the insane car drive as kirk douglas is driving under the waterfall suddenly we're dissolving to the airport uh, in rome it, it just seemed a little strange but as i mentioned there was studio interference here most notably in what was supposed to be an orgy sequence. Uh, in the film, you'll recall that Kirk Douglas's character goes to a party, Leslie Uggins, Uggams is seen singing there, and they're all hanging around the next day from what looks like a massive group hangover. Well, originally this was supposed to be a little more explicit. Uh, as Stephen Harvey writes, uh, as Manelli conceived this Bacchanale, a collection of jet-set decadence lolled about in a narcotic stupor while an erotic tableau unfolds for their jaded delectation, just outside camera range. Manelli took particular pride in the sequence, aiming to combine his customary elegance with a jolt worthy of the fresh story of today that MGM wanted. However, the head of MGM was outraged that any MGM movie would contain such smut, however implicit, and he vowed to expunge it personally if necessary. And that's what happened. Uh, the film was turned over to the chief cutter, Margaret Booth, uh, for editing. She, she, she cut against her better wishes. John Hausman intervened and was somehow convinced the studio to let him get a chance to put some of the film back together. But Manelli was never a part of the problem and didn't feel that he uh, was treated well. Manelli wrote in his memoir, not only was the orgy sequence cut, but a scene where she, in which Sid Charisse's character gave her distorted view of life was also inex inexplicably dropped. Without it, one never knew why she tried to maintain her hold on her husband. And there is, uh, obviously you see the trailer with women getting slapped and, and shoved around. Uh, this is not a feminist's uh, a field day at the, at the cinema. Stephen Harvey, in writing about the film, wrote, apparently Manelli was powerless against the venom of Charles Schnee's script. Uh, Schnee was in a horrific marriage, and he seemed to be exercising his demons uh, during the writing. Uh, Harvey writes, such wholesale misogyny has no precedent in Manelli's movies, and his discomfiture shows in, a, in the one-note caricatures, caricatures he extracted from the obedient actresses in the film. You know, we've all heard of film noir. There's a lesser known term called film modi, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Maybe Marianne will correct this. M-A-U-D-I-T, a film that yeah. is initially received very badly when it's released, but over time um, comes to look more interesting in the, in the perspective of the career of the director, Vincent Minnelli, and the many people who were in the film. And, and it was also tampered with very badly on the, by the studio. I think we're estimating probably cut by 20 minutes or more from the version that we saw today, which I think runs about an hour and 45 minutes, something to that effect. But I think what I, what I see in it now and what stays with me for the over, over the 40 plus years since I first saw it as part of a big Vincent Minnelli series, which included many of his classics like The Bad and the Beautiful, which is referenced in this movie. And even I think there's, there's clips from The Bad and the Beautiful being watched by Edward G. Robinson, the producer, director, Kruger, and Kirk Douglas's uh, character, Jack Andrus and Sid Gerice and, and others as perhaps some kind of uh, epitome of, you know, the best years of their life, the best years of their career and, and uh, better days, which are far behind many of the characters in the film, uh, like the ones I just mentioned. And then others like the young George, uh, George Hamilton character, who Vincent Minnelli had been grooming in several films up to this point, kind of struggling with who he is as both an actor and a man 
of course, now Kirk Douglas himself had not fallen on hard times. He was at the peak of his stardom at this point, having been in pictures like Spartacus, the Vikings, Gunfight at the OK Corral, uh, Lonely or the Brave. He wasn't personally struggling, but of course that character is. And there's, there's, there's uh, uh, a sense that he is kind of the fulcrum or the, the centrifugal force in which a number of the other characters are also spiraling out of control. Edward G. Robinson, uh, Sid Charisse, uh, and, and, and George Hamilton. So I think there's, there's, there's a sense of melancholy in the film that somehow to me over time is memorable. And then the, I think the second time I saw it, maybe 20 or 25 years ago, double featured with the bad and the beautiful uh, at, at, at a theater that no longer exists uh, just south of Canal Street. I'm trying to remember the name of it now, a small uh, theater, which was uh, a little twin art house uh, cinema, no longer in, uh, in public service, at least as, a, uh, as an art house. So that's, uh, that's where I would start in terms of my recollections and, you know, why see it? I, I think it, it probably demands some context and, and uh, some of our viewers may go back and see some other Vincent Minnelli films like The Bad and the Beautiful, The Bandwagon, which showcased Sid, Sid Charisse and some of the other melodramas like Some Came Running, oh, yeah. maybe Frank Sinatra's best performance, uh, or one of them. Uh, and, uh, 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 Home from the Hill, where George Hamilton was first introduced as the son of, uh, as, of Robert Mitchum. Uh, the kind of two sides of Vincent Minnelli, the, the musical side and the, and, the, uh, and the melodrama side, both of which are, are still, to me, uh, completely fascinating. Thank you, Gary. Gary, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for your for your insights. Into, into I, 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 hope, I hope that helps. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of you know, thinking about it now. I'm kind of feeling feeling the melancholy of the picture, particularly that scene at the end where Kirk Douglas drives into a, a, a Roman fountain or a, water, a waterfall or something, you know. and there's some kind of uh, uh, chastening or cleansing or-, or An uh, epiphany. An He's epiphany, found exactly. the truth at last. Yes, and, yeah. and I remember what he says to George Hamilton, I think they're at an airport or something, and he said, you don't need anybody. You know, you can, you can make it on your own or something, and that's, somehow yeah. it's, very, it's, it's very compelling, even under melodramatic circumstances. This is the widescreen title, and I want to remind you all, uh, this is the chart that I showed when I first did a presentation on the look of the film for Clute. And I just want to call your attention to the frame in the middle on the right side. That's what we're looking at today, the widest possible frame. The aspect ratio is the ratio of width to height. Here we are at Chinechita where some of the film was made. Apparently, they had a limited amount of time there and returned to Culver City for a lot of studio work. Um, <clears throat> this is the first representation we see in the film of the shooting of a scene. There's nothing horribly wrong going on here. It's a natural, uh, authentic, scenic backdrop. And uh, the director... Uh, Mr. Robinson is on a boom with a megaphone. Of course, you can't direct without a megaphone. Um, and here, by contrast, later on in the film, is what it looks like very artificially as they're reshooting the scene under Jack Andrus's direction um, uh, in a studio. And you can see that there is a fake backdrop, and the boat is on some sort of a I don't know what to call it. Um, it's it, it enables them a gimbal, perhaps. That may be it. That helps them rock the boat believably. Um, I want to also sympathize for poor Claire Trevor, who was given this horrible role. Um, she must have agreed to it. I don't think she, there was a gun pointed to her head, but it's it's a thankless thing for a woman who was a really good, solid actress, especially in the noir era. She was very dependable. I'm showing this uh, frame just to show what a director loves to do with mirrors. We saw some of that last time in Don't Look Now. And here we have, it uh, looks like four separate images of Carla, or no, it's Clara. Clara is the wife uh, haranguing her poor husband, Maurice. Um, here is another interesting mirror setup, And this comes right after Maurice and Jack have had a massive argument. And Maurice has 
exited the shot on the left-hand side, leaving into another room. You can see a glimpse into the other room. Kirk Douglas comes in and sees two very important props sitting on the dresser. And I just love the way this shot is composed. You see Douglas torn between these two props in the mirror, the Oscar and the bottle of whiskey, which are sort of emblems of his life. Uh, another shot of Douglas is he's getting a troubling phone call. I can't quite recall who it is. This might be um, Carlotta on the phone. Sit that's, sure. that's a, yes, it is. And uh, in typical noir fashion, they attempted to do the Venetian blind look, but it doesn't really seem to work here. Uh, Venetian blinds are never that thick and far apart. Um, anyway, they didn't take it very seriously because in the very next shot where it cuts to a wide shot outside the room, Kirk is leaving and you can see behind him that those bars just aren't there anymore. There's one shadow across the edge of the bed and that's it. So um, this is not intended as a praising summary of the work of Milton Krasner, the director of photography. Um, here we see uh, one of those clips from The Bad and the Beautiful. And I'm just showing this to indicate the difference in aspect ratios. The Bad and the Beautiful was filmed in 133 to 1, and now we're out at 235 to 1. So they put curtains on either side, which was, you know, appropriate in a projection room where they're screening it. Here is a shot. I believe this is the Spanish Steps. Can you confirm that for me? Anybody, Max? It certainly is. That is the Spanish Steps. Yes. I was there once, but not at night, so I can't quite recognize it, but this is the scene where they uh, they hire the street artist to draw her face into a painting. That's the lovely and talented Dahlia Lavi. And just a couple of words about her while she's on screen. She was born in Israel and is fluent in, take a deep breath here, French, Italian, German, Hebrew, Spanish, and English. Now, Unfortunately, Hollywood didn't really care too much about how many languages an actress could speak. And her films, she has a total of 30 film credits. Uh, the next Hollywood film she did was Lord Jim, directed by Richard Brooks, and her character is named The Girl. Uh, that was followed by The Silencers, a Dean Martin vehicle for the Matt Helm James Bond imitator. And lastly, she was, not lastly, but the last that I'm going to talk about is she was in the rather chaotic 1967 version of Casino Royale. Here we have a sunset shot, which looks very authentic to me. I, I kept thinking, well, maybe that's background projection, but it looks awfully real. Uh, usually you can tell that there's a difference in photography between the foreground and the background, but this looks authentic. Another good shot, thank you, Mr. Krasner, something artful here, of Jack and Veronica walking through Rome at night. And here we see them silhouetted by uh, the reflection of light off the pavement. And I also love the way they put half the frame in darkness. It's using the cinema, cinemascope frame very effectively and very artfully, I think. One more shot from their midnight promenade. And I'm citing this because of the three clerics on the right-hand side of the frame, all garbed in red. And we're going to get back to the color red in a short while. Here is the aforementioned George Hamilton, who I also agree has a very good performance in this film. Uh, it's nothing like Zorro the Gay Blade, but he's doing some really serious dramatic acting and deserves some credit for it. And by the way, Mr. Hamilton is still going strong. He has a new film to be released called All Terrain, and he has 126 film credits to his credit. This is an interesting shot <clears throat> because, I, once again, I think it's fairly realistic at depicting an editing room. Uh, we see Kirk is looking at the movie on a moviola, which is the machine that would run your film through a little gate so that you could watch it on the small screen that you can see in front of him. Um, <clears throat> George Hamilton is looking over his shoulder, although 
One reason I always hated the movie Ola is it's really hard for more than one person to see the image at a time. Um, thank God for flatbed editing tables. Um, the lady on the right, you will note, has her left hand in a glove, which is how one was supposed to handle 35 millimeter film, or 16 for that matter. This is an interesting and clever shot. I'm sure when Manelli got to the Hotel Excelsior and he saw the elevator with the glass front on it, he thought, oh, let's shoot there. So they put the camera in the elevator. The elevator door is open. Prior to this, uh, Kirk Douglas got on, and now we see um, Sid Charisse with her date for the night, played by Stefan Schnabel, a well-used character actor. They get on the elevator. We see it. The elevator rise from the inside and everybody gets out and there is a reverse shot, which I don't have here, of Douglas seen from the outside as he stays on the elevator. But it's a clever shot and I, I applaud that. Well, I want to point out the gentleman with no hair uh, next to the left and that is none other than Eric von Stroheim Jr., the son of the man you love to hate who played the chauffeur in Sunset Boulevard. And I guess young Eric Jr. felt he had to shave his skull in order to be recognized as Eric Jr. And he does have a credit here as assistant director on Two Weeks in Another Town. And he also has an acting credit, which is highly unusual for someone who is usually busy behind the camera. <clears throat> This is in the dubbing room, and I want to call your attention as we're starting to get into this look here. Kirk is in a red sweater, and there are red upholstered seats in the dubbing room. Aside from that, it's worth noting that in Italy, where they literally dub all the sound, sometimes they'll record it on the set or on location, but they never use it, and they always have it dubbed in. And dubbing was sort of the last gasp of someone trying to be creative with a film shot in Italy. You could change the performances a bit if you coached your actors or your dubbers with great finesse. Here we are, read once again in the hotel room of Maurice Kruger, who is very sick indeed, uh, but you notice he's got a red blanket, a red backboard on his bed, headboard, red curtains in the background. So I asked my resourceful partner, Janet, last night, what's with red in Rome? And she found out, thank you, Janet, that red is a color associated with Rome, which goes back to ancient Rome. And red is the color of Mars, the god of war. It's the color of blood and courage. And Apparently, that is the original source of it. It goes back to ancient times. Here we have red costuming on the part of Rosanna Schiaffino and Kirk Douglas. And as if that didn't drive it home enough for you, they put them in front of a red carpeted stairway for one last shot in this scene. So red, red, red. And it's, it's kind of cool. I think it looks good. Here is the scene that it's easy to make fun of. Uh, I don't have much to say about it, except that it's just crazy and it doesn't really work, at least for today's audiences. It might have thrilled people in 1962, but now it just looks kind of silly. And the spinning car and the ineffectual background shots, it's, it's kind of a mistake. Okay, that's the end of the look of the film. And now I would like to say a few words about this man, Irwin Shaw. He was born in the Bronx with the original name of Erwin Shamforoff, born in 1913. And he spent a lot of time in Brooklyn before finally getting out of New York and finding his way to Hollywood, where he was not just a novelist. And I want to recommend reading an Erwin Shaw novel. He is a very good writer when it comes to putting words on the page. Um, <clears throat> He, he wrote his first big best-selling book was The Young Lions, which was mangled by Hollywood in a feature film with Marlon Brando and Dean Martin and uh, Montgomery Clift, I believe. Um, 
he is probably best known to American audiences for having written Rich Man, Poor Man, on which a TV miniseries was based. Um, Erwin Shaw was one of those guys who hung out in the post-war years in Europe. The people that he hung out with were Peter Matheson, James Jones, William Styron, James Baldwin, and Kirk Douglas was a drinking buddy of his. But the one person I want to quote on Erwin Shaw is probably my favorite author of that era. I'll say his name twice. It's James Salter, S-A-L-T-E-R, James Salter. Read anything by him. I think of him as a writer's writer. And I'm going to quote here one paragraph from Salter's memoir called Burning the Days, which is a brilliant piece of work, um, on the topic of Erwin Shaw. He's got a whole chapter on him, but this quote leapt out of the page at me. He was my unknowing Virgil, brief in his description, irrefutable, fond of drink. Years later, I heard him give some advice. Never be in awe of anyone. He was not in awe of Europe. He tossed his coat on her couch which is an excellent phrase, one reason why I like to quote it. Um, one other thing about Erwin Shaw, he wrote a lot of screenplays. He was not allowed to write the screenplay for Two Weeks from Another Town. Wonder how good that would have been. Probably better, I think. But there is one film that is very hard to find. Hey, Lucy, sorry, my dog has found something to growl at. Um, it's a film called Act of Love. And if you can find it, it's available on DVD only in a European edition, but they apparently have the original English language with subtitles. Um, I happen to capture it off of Turner Classic Movies, so I have my own DVD copy. Um, and it starred Kirk Douglas, a French actress named Danny Robin, and an actress who was later to become a bit more celebrated, Brigitte Bardot in an early role. Um, it was adapted from a novel by Alfred Hayes, originally set in Rome, but the director, Anatole Litvak, wanted it moved to Paris because it was his favorite town to, oh, party in. So um, that's my tribute to Erwin Shaw. And Max, you wanted to come back in? Oh, I have to come back in, Dan. You, this has been such a, a provocative observation that that you've made, and and uh, I just I would like to respond to a couple of things. That was wonder, wonderful observations about the visual look of the film. As an FYI, that crazy car scene was viewed as crazy in 1962 as well. Yeah. England's mon monthly film bulletin wrote. The crazy car ride is a magnificently choreographed display of out and out lunacy. And it does harken back to this crazy Lana Turner driving scene in The Bad and the Beautiful, where the car camera is circling around the car as she's crying behind the wheel. And in a crazy way, Martin Scorsese paid homage, oh, excuse me, homage to these two Manelli car scenes when he made New York, New York. There's a there's another screen, screaming, cry, crying, insane car scene with Robert De Niro and Liza Manelli. And I, I think Scorsese was referencing not only The Bad and the Beautiful, but Two Weeks in Another Town. A scene that aroused much criticism from critics then and now is a scene in Two Weeks in Another Town that takes place in a screening room at Chine Chita, where Kirk Douglas and Edward G. Robinson and others are screening an earlier collaboration between the Douglas and the Robinson characters. And they're extolling the virtues of this film. And Douglas says to Robinson, Kruger, you're great. And the movie that they're watching is Vincent Minnelli's The Bad and the Beautiful from 1952, 10 years earlier, which starred Kirk Douglas, was produced by John Hausman. And this is seen as something as seen as something of an ego trip by Minnelli and company. But in fairness to everyone, the 1960 Irwin Shaw novel actually contains a scene where 
the Douglas and the Robinson characters go to a Roman cinema to see a film that they made together 20 years earlier that's being revived, a movie called The Stolen Midnight. And the Edward G. Robinson character is very upset that the screening is preceded by a newsreel showing political tensions in Algeria, riots in Northern Italy, visits by Queen Elizabeth, airplane wreckage. And he says to the Douglas character, what a prelude to a work of art, bloodshed in the faces of politicians. I'd like to see them do it at Carnegie Hall. Put on a man being broken on the rack, followed by a speech by a senator from Mississippi on the offshore oil question. Then play the Seventh Symphony. The movies. In his 1974 memoir, I remember it well, Manelli wrote, we'd wanted to use Champion, which was a Mark Robeson film from 1949. Kirk's first big hit, but United Artists wanted too much money for us to use it. The only other important picture of Kirk's immediately available to us was The Bad and the Beautiful. In using it, we were accused, perhaps justly, of being immodest. One thing was sure, however, in two weeks, we certainly hadn't matched our past standard. I've got a couple of reviews that I'm going to quote. This is from a really good biography of Erwin Shaw by Michael Schneerson, I think. Schneerson, sorry. It's not an easy name. It doesn't flow trippingly off the tongue. Um, the New York Times, good old Bosley Crowther, said, the whole thing is a lot of glib trade patter, ridiculous and unconvincing romantic snarls, and a weird professional clash between the actor and the director that is like something out of a Hollywood cartoon. <laughs> I can't disagree with him. Um, Time Magazine. The problem, Time declared, was that Vincent Minnelli and Kirk Douglas had, in a sense, worked too hard. Quote, they are dead serious, and therein lies their error. The subject is too trivial for serious treatment. There you have well, it. Could argue that, uh, we could argue that Minnelli was kind of winking at the camera from time to time during all this. I, sure. He, he is having his jollies as well. The idea of an actor going to Rome to work behind the scenes in dubbing, in editing, and so forth, is not too far-fetched because... There was an actor by the name of Mickey Knox, who had been a supporting actor, a character actor in the 40s, who was blacklisted under the, the Hollywood Cold War, HUAC era, and had to become a dialogue director in Hollywood. And then he went to Rome and was a go-to guy to work with, with Hollywood actors, getting acclimated in, in the Roman film community, with Italian actors trying to speak English for Hollywood co-productions. And he wrote a very entertaining book about his experiences in the 60s that were similar to that of the Kirk Douglas character called The Good, The Bad, and The Dolce Vita, uh, which is certainly an, an entertaining read as well. Charles Schnee, the screenwriter, a little bit of background around him. He had written some film noir pictures, uh, such as the Burt Lancaster film, I Walk Alone. He wrote some films for director Nicholas Ray, including the brilliant They Live by Night. He wrote Howard Hawks's Western Red River. He wrote the Western The Furies for Anthony Mann, and of course, The Bad and the Beautiful for Manelli. He also became a producer uh, in in the late fifties, he produced films for for Mar uh, I'm sorry Robert Wise and Mark Robeson, such as Somebody Up th Up There Likes Me. But there was this very tortured private life, and sadly enough, not long after it was a little over a year after his wife took her own life, while two weeks in another town was going into production. Charles Schnee, just a few short months after the film opened, died of a fatal heart attack, and he was only 46 years of age. So the the trauma, the, the blood, the sweat, and the tears that go into these pictures uh, cannot be overstated. There's a, and there is some considerable screenwriting talent in those titles you just rattled off. Extraordinary. I mean, Red yes. River is... I mean, maybe one of the best westerns ever made and it's due to the script as much as anything um, I excuse me a second I, I can never see here the word red river without telling anyone everyone that 
my in film school, I had to watch it frame by frame <laughs> by frame. And I love that film. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. No, for it. Tre- tremendous, tremendous, ta- tremendous talent there. And, uh, oh. Uh, the only a, c- a couple of things, just about a couple of more actors in the cast uh, at the airport scene, George McReady gets slapped by Kirk Douglas. And then he appears later when he sees he can make some money off of Kirk Douglas. Mc- McReady, the actor known for his somewhat smarmy, aristocratic creepy. characters. Creepy. Re- creepy, aristocratic characters. Yeah. He was, he was uh, Rita Hayworth's hu- husband in Gilda. Oh, yeah. He. He also was the very unsavory, corrupt French general in Kubrick's Paths of Glory, which yeah. Douglas's company produced. And so th- there was a bit of a, a background. A, a McReady, McReady had a scar on one cheek and they don't show it much in this movie. But in other films, the scar plays a big part in his character. So he, he was uh, another man you love to hate. Not just von Stroheim, but McReady comes in there too. D- definitely, definitely, and and you had also uh, James Gregory, who was the columnist who we had we had seen from the same year. He was he was in the uh, the Manchurian Candidate as the as that uh, marionette, the the, yeah. the marionette who was being manipulated by his wife uh, Angela Lansbury. Uh, so it was a, a very a, a very eclectic. Uh, cast uh, Manelli. By the way, just before we turn things over to to our viewers today, he understandably was annoyed by MGM being a little prudish about this project. He he basically was saying in his memoir, "My gosh, the same year that my film came out, Kubrick's Lolita came out from MGM, and they left that picture alone. Why did they? Why did they go after mine?" And it didn't seem to me so much to do with Rome or Italy as it did with the movie making process. So um, one of my takeaways from the film uh, was a a greater appreciation for the director. Um, And, you know, it's sort of interesting because oftentimes, uh, you know, we focus on on the directors of the films and and there's so many other people involved in the making of the film. I hadn't really sort of appreciated how important the director is overall. I have to say, and and I um, sort of took that away from this film. But my question is, is there has been so many films about the industry itself. How do you think this one ranks as you com- as you look at it about as a film about the industry? It's it's very unusual to see a film that deals with this co-production, this this Hollywood going to Europe thing that was very prominent at the time. Usually films about Hollywood take place exclusively in Los Angeles or in Hollywood. So that made it a little more interesting. We we got a bit of a sense of the, the, the business when Kruger, the Edward G. Robinson character, is arguing with his Italian producer in the, the bar at the Excelsior. And the producer says, look, I've already made my 450,000 and, and we're going to release this picture regardless of what you want to do with your with your dubbing. And, and so that was a fascinating fascinating look at the the machinations of what goes on behind the scenes. You certainly do get a sense, as you were saying, Kathleen, of the director's part of, of how destructive making a movie of this stat, of this kind is to is to what a, what a director goes through. I and mean, it's literally killing the Edward G. Robinson character. Or is it or is he using it to manipulate others? You get a sense of the manipulation, but also the de- the self-destructive uh, characteristics that go into taking on that kind of a job. Uh, Dan, I'm sure can add to that. I I would like to say that um, aside from the politics and the what's going on behind the scenes stuff, there is one film that stands out in representing the craft of filmmaking beautifully. And that is Day for Night by Francois Truffaut. Mm -hmm. Um, We have referred to it. uh, Maybe it's time sometime to do a full talk back on the film it's it's a classic i i think you're right and and maybe maybe we might even be able to show it at some point but yeah no it would be it would be exciting yeah yeah so that's the movie to go to if you're curious on how films are really put together 
Um, oh, great suggestion. Thank you. Yeah. And, and it's yeah. one, it's pretty much one of the only films in which movie making is not portrayed in a bitter fashion. <laughs> kind of the joy of the process. Yes. 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 Uh, and it's a beautiful visual work also and the music anyway it's a great film and you should see it as soon as possible i also do want to say that i think the bad and the beautiful represents hollywood skullduggery and throat slashing uh, better than this one does and if you want to see minnelli and schnee doing some of their best work watch that it's it's a great film okay thanks I also had one other question that I put Please. in the chat and I didn't know whether it was just a continuity issue or, 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 a... anyway, it was, um, uh, the young woman who is infatuated with Kirk Douglas character. What was her name? Did it start Veronica. with a Veronica. 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 The character. Yes. Yes. The character Veronica at one point references the fact that she has a black eye. And I was a little confused about that. Well, I, it, I, I think I take it as a reference to the fact that in their little beach scene, Kirk Douglas says to her, I love a woman with black eyes. That's in the dialogue. And this is oh, no. about to kiss her as she's lying down on the beach. So that's all I can figure. We never see or hear anything about someone assaulting her. Do well, we? Wait a minute. No, no, no. Well, in the screen, in the was screening it the George room, Hamilton? Uh, in the screening room, the George Papard yeah. character slaps her. George Hamilton. George Hamilton. George please. Hamilton. Sorry, George. George <laughs> Pappard would never have done that. <laughs> no lawyers, please. But yeah. the George Hamilton character kind of right. Up. You're right. You're right. Oh, okay. All right. So, I thought also that it might have come from him after after he she he discovers that she has been with Kurt Douglas, right? I thought maybe there was like a I think, there, I, I think that there was a combination of both, in my opinion. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, yeah. it's too bad. It was a little unfortunate the way a lot of the women were portrayed in this film. But. Oh, yeah, as I, as I say, the screenwriter, Charles Schnee, was working out some issues in the <laughs> whole world. <laughs> unfortunately. Okay, thanks a lot, guys. Great to okay. see you, Kathleen. Good to see you. Thank you. Bye. Russell? Bye. Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon. You know, I, I, I sort of felt in watching this that it, it seemed to be a pretty slight film, but then I read a review that that, that made me change my mind a little bit. And it, it what it said was that this film was trying to adapt to the change in cultural and artistic mores of the 60s. And mm -hmm. thinking back to that time where we had the civil rights going on, the Vietnam um, was, was starting to um, build up. There was, you know, the, the nuclear destruction option, you know, all these things are going on. The, it was the end of the studio part of Hollywood and they were moving on, but nobody really knew where exactly they were moving on to. And um, it, it it also compared it to a film I've never heard of called Contempt, which ah. was apparently done later. And it's a Goddard film. Contempt. And it said in that film, um, that was completely steeped in the modernist or the post-war modernist world, whereas this film was was based ostensibly in the classical world. And then this artist also said that, um, for example, like the, it, he brought in Hitchcock's Marnie, where that was Hitchcock's attempt to try to, you know, uh, move into the post-war modernist world and this, this whole cultural adaption. That was Hitchcock's. And this one was Minnelli's attempt to do the same thing. I wondered if you had any thoughts on all that. Great quotes, Russell. Yeah. You, you know, I'm sorry. In, in, who who wrote ahead, this David. material again, Russell? I, I wish I had written down the name. I, I I didn't, however. I'm sorry. Okay, that's all right. Absolutely fascinating. What I find compelling here is that this is Hollywood in all its overblown, over-budgeted glory, trying to compete with European filmmakers who are making things on a on a dime or on a budget. And it's trying to cash in on the La Dolce Vita sensation, but this movie almost cost $4 million at the time, which was massive. Fellini certainly wasn't spending nearly that much. And Godard's Contempt of the following year, which is a wonderful film worth seeing, was made for far less than, than uh, Two Weeks in Another Town. And you have, you have Minnelli and, you, and you, you cited Hitchcock and Marnie, they're trying to catch up, but they're still stuck in the sound stages and the back lots and the studio artifice. It's hard for them to break free and be naturalistic. 
and compete with what's going on when there are these rem- there are these amazing studio stylists. But how do you break free from that? Bellini had done the opposite. He he started out filming on the streets and then went to the studio st- sound stages. Whereas, but what if you start out in the sound stages, it's a little harder to break break free and go in in more authentic surroundings to 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 do this naturalism that maybe that other writer was citing. I don't know, Dan, if you have anything to add to that. No, and I'm frankly, I'm still trying to figure out Marnie in this context. I got seriously distracted there. So only that it, maybe it was touching on a little bit more adult themes that might have challenged perhaps censorship yeah. conventions but i think maybe adult themes and trying to get it more delve more into the psychological aspects of the characters that's what I, I thought perhaps he was meaning and also that that um you know that that um topic of um was um um uh, an adult sort of a it was an adult sort of a a topic i guess um involved in that um the other thing that i, I wanted to ask what well, the same um person um, brought he said that he invokes in the, in two weeks in another town he in uh, he invokes Antonioni in the barren cold um alienating landscape which Kirk Douglas wanders through dazed and am and and um dazed and alienated it and when I first started off I, I I was a little puzzled because I thought he was in his mansion or something it seemed like it took me a while to figure out that this was a man who was in you know a mental asylum and so I had a trouble get you know just getting started in the film trying to figure out what yeah. was going on because I'd read the summary uh and, and and couldn't pull it all together he's playing shuffleboard in a rehab center I mean, go figure I, <laughs> but the Antonioni connection, I think that's a viable one. And I think perhaps and it's had it not been edited down, some of those bourgeois decadent parties would have would have had more of a not only a Fellini-esque feel, but maybe an Antonioni look at the decadent, miserable bourgeoisie <laughs> feel to them that I think Manelli was was trying to go for. That's a good analogy. Thank you. Thank you, Russell. Thank you, Thanks, Russell. Russell. Carol Greenberg, can you unmute and, and uh, start your video? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Okay, I just have two questions. Do you think at the end that um, uh, Maurice Kruger th- thought that Jack Andros was stealing his film? Was he? Do you think Jack Andros? I'm sorry, I phrased it wrong. Do you think Jack Andros? was stealing Maurice's film. And the second question, whom else did they have in mind to play Sid Charisse's part? Well, the the second que- part of the question I can uh, ask ask first. Uh, I don't know who they were originally considering for her part. I It sounds as though Kirk Douglas, since he said she's no Lana Turner, or she ain't she ain't Lana Turner, he would have preferred someone to the uh, on, on the par with Lana Turner. Uh-huh. But, uh, I don't recall them identifying specific actresses for, okay. for that role. Now the the first I I Dan may disagree. I didn't get a sense that the Douglas character was trying to s- steal the picture from Kruger. I think he bought into Kruger's mental crisis, or I'm sorry, physical health crisis. Mm-hmm. And he became victim to the manipulation that mm-hmm. obviously Kruger's wife was sort of pitting the two men against each other. I felt that Douglas's motives were sincere, mm-hmm. and you might feel otherwise. Yes, well, I did. I did. I, I think it's important that nobody reacted to bad dubbing or something that went wrong or changed the picture. Mm-hmm. Uh, they never went, and we never saw a reaction to. Uh, Jack's dubbing of the film. So apparently right. it didn't do much harm. Right. It, it gets a there's a lot of unresolved as the final reel is clattering through the projector, there's a, there's some unresolved issues like what you're talking about. How what did they think of the work that that Douglas's character was doing? We don't get much of a sense of that. And also, is he's when he goes back to, to California or to the United States, what's going to happen to him? Is he going to be able to get it together? It seemed it seemed rushed and abrupt. The, the 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 resolution did that have to do with the recutting? Hard to say without reading did the screenplay. Did he also um, when he left? He left the two of them there he, it, it, in Italy, uh, Davy and and Veronica. He left mm-hmm. them there because he knew they were going to be together, or he didn't want her to come, or 
Well, it's it's almost in a, it, this, it's Hollywood's way of matchmaking. I got have, a, have an affair with a with a man's girlfriend, and then bring the two of them together to show how great a person you are. <laughs> I don't get it, but that seems to be that's yeah. that's Hollywood's idea of romance. Right. So he was bringing these two lovers together. I it's a way it. of rehabilitating Kirk yeah. Douglas's character uh-huh. without him having to go back into rehab again. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank Great. you, Carol. Great Carol. presentation. Thank Great. you so much. Joshua, can you start your video and your audio, please? And if anyone else has any questions, please raise your hand. Otherwise, Joshua will be the last. I always learn from these uh, sessions of yours. I found the film um, so complex and so many things going on that it was almost murky in terms of uh, um, uh, pushing my way through it. Uh, so in terms of what you were talking about, um, uh, you showed me some very interesting perspectives in terms of how to look at it. But I'll tell you what struck me. Last night, I was watching, you were talking about the price that is paid by these people who are really artists uh, in cinema and how, how it really affects their personality and it, it really affects their lives. Mm-hmm. Last night, I was re-watching the DVD of Paris Blues. Ah, which we've talked and, about before, yeah. And uh, uh, there you had Newman and Poitier and how they were devoted to jazz and how, how that really affected their lives so they couldn't really get out of a rut. And at the, at the end, you, you don't know what's gonna happen to them. Uh, mm-hmm. It ain't so pleasant to be brilliant or be, uh, or be talented. Uh, it's sometimes. a curse actually. And, and, and Paris Blues was the year before this film. And it, it's you're, yeah, that's a great analogy because you have a narrative with, with expats who are living overseas. And in this case, working overseas and and bringing their emotional baggage and and uh, inner turmoil with them and it's worth noting i remember saying this when i was at the school of the arts at nyu saying frequently you know art is hard work mm-hmm. it's not something that you just sort of flit in and out of and suddenly everybody loves what you're doing it requires experience and training and disappointment and heartbreak and all of those things. So um, I think they're they're trying to be realistic about this. I'm reminded of a quote I read in a Kevin Brownlow biography of David director David Lean. It was when they were writing about the making of Ryan's daughter or something. Somebody who worked on the film was quoted as saying, "Making a making a picture is the worst experience you could possibly have as a director. It is absolutely awful." but not making a picture is worse. Yes. There's no <laughs> happiness in this business. <laughs> and here's well, an well. example of that in two weeks in another town. Indeed. Um, Russell, you had your hand up. Um, did we still have time for your question? Yeah, it was just a quick question. You know, are you Max, you had, you had seemed familiar with the film Contempt, and I wondered if you could comment on what they were saying about the, you know, this film and, and, and Contempt and, and the uh, postmodernist versus classical. Thank you. Well, uh, sure. Well, Contempt, which Jean-Luc Godard directed, it's very funny because it deals with the problems of a co-production because you have this this European co-production being produced by a vulgar American producer played by Jack Palance. And the running joke that I think most people didn't understand at the time was nobody can communicate with each other. <laughs> so you know, Jack Palance is barking things in English. There's a young woman there tr- mistranslating what he's saying into French. And then somebody else is mistranslating what someone says in French back into English. And Godard is having some fun with that. But it, it, it's very experimental, as any Godard picture is, in terms of the way the narrative occurs and musical themes keep repeating themselves. And it's the most, I think, endurable of a Godard film because Godard, much to his horror, actually had to follow a screenplay, which he hated doing. So it's a little more easier to sit through than some of his other experiments. And Contempt was much better received 
than two weeks in another town. If you're trying to compare the two, yes, uh, it was. I don't want to say self-consciously arty, but it was a very arty film from Europe. And that's how people saw it. And it was taken far more seriously than Kirk Douglas driving crazy and drunk with Sid Cherie screaming next to him. So I think there's there's a lot to be said for contempt. Yes, definitely. Following on Max's Wednesday lecture on Los Angeles in cinema, we're going to be dealing with The Long Goodbye, a Robert Altman film from the early 70s. 73, am I right? Somewhere in there? Absolutely. Um, and it is a favorite film of mine. I'm not going to try and oversell it, but my department of the look of the film will be broadly dealt with in two weeks. Uh, Altman was working with a truly pioneering cinematographer, the Hungarian immigre Vilmos Zsigmond. And he won an Oscar eventually, but here he was doing literally dangerous, risky experimentation with the image. And we're going to talk about that. And when you watch it before our discussion, just note how the image looks kind of different than it usually did. So, plus it's an Altman film, so we're going to have a lot of overlapping dialogue and dry humor, and it's an attempt to adapt a Raymond Chandler novel, specifically a Philip Marlowe detective novel, into a vehicle for Elliot Gould and Robert Altman. So, it's going to be fun. That's all I'll say. <laughs>